I had been working as a forest ranger for almost five years. A ranger's day could consist of anything from collecting firewood to tracking down missing hikers. And my day began like most. I would wake up early, walking into work and grabbing my binoculars. As I was about to drive out of the forest, I got a call. That day, I was given a new assignment. I met up with another colleague, a fellow ranger, and we went to the center of this area where somebody had been reporting hearing strange screaming coming from around a cave system nearby. My partner and I decided that I would be able to handle it by myself. He had other things to do, and this was just another run-of-the-mill investigation for me. After he left, I headed towards that area where there had been several unreported mounds to this cave system. Now let me give you some information. This cave system runs pretty deep and there are guided tours, but I also know that this cave system is very expansive and also has a lot of unidentified entrances and holes that can lead deeper into the system. These are also off trail, so myself I've never actually experienced finding more of these, although I know hikers have reported finding many and even leaving makeshift markers to let other hikers know this was an entrance. The parts of the ground here were also dangerous, meaning if you step on the wrong part, the ground below you could collapse, falling into a tunnel. So I had to be very careful about how I approached this entire search. The good news is I wasn't hearing any screaming, so that could be good or bad news. The bad news meaning the hiker, whoever was stuck there, could have been deceased or what. But the good news being that maybe the hiker had gotten themselves out. Anyway, my heart was pounding just by the sheer adrenaline of it. I didn't know why, but something told me to run. It was this feeling in the pit of my gut. As soon as I got there, right around the cavern system, the wind picked up, and everything seemed colder than it already was. A gust. Now I could have begun my investigation in the main entrance, but as I was planning, I heard the scream. It sounded like a person, but they were maybe a couple hundred feet away north. So I marched through the trees, looking, following the source of the screaming, yelling out, Can you hear me? Can you respond? And the screaming ceased. I followed along the rock wall and found this crude hole in the ground, maybe no larger than five feet. It was right by a rotted tree stump with only one branch on it. This, I knew, probably went down into one of the cave systems. This, by the way, was probably no more than 200 feet away from the main entrance. After crouching down, I was able to slide down at a 45 degree angle into this cave system, landing in a small chamber that I think connected to the others. I always carry a flashlight with me, so I took it out and turned it on. As soon as I did that, the caves plunged into darkness as my battery instantly died. That's when I heard a loud crash. I turned around, or I should say, turned to meet the noise, and my flashlight popped back on. There, like out of some sort of sick Stephen King novel, was this grotesque figure. Large black eyes covering its entire body, stretching its arms out and moving toward me. Terrified, I wanted to turn and run, but didn't have time, as there was another one of these beings coming from the opposite side of the cave approaching. I turned as fast as I could and fled up the 45 degree incline about the cave. Just as I was turning to climb up, I could hear a third one approaching from directly behind me. Now I had one coming from my left, my right, and behind me. This one, as I turned and looked, was larger than the other two. Completely terrified out of my mind, and the sounds of screaming were now apparent, coming deeper in the cavern. I don't know if it was an injured hiker, or if these things were making the noise, luring anybody into this tiny crevice, this chamber into the earth. Like I said, the opening to this cavern wasn't large, but I never in a million years would have expected to find things like this. This was horror movie status. I didn't tell anybody else about what I found and kept it to myself. After climbing out of that hole, I ran and ran and ran some more, getting back to the station later on. I didn't say a word and I knew the other rangers wouldn't believe me. And what would I tell them? That I found a cave full of half arachnids, half creatures. I mean, they'd probably think I was crazy. Now I've kept this sacred for a while, 
but how long can I keep it from the rest of the world? Will my story ever be told to other people, or should I just stay quiet about what had happened? Let me just apologize and say I'm sorry for the formatting of the story. I'm a terrible writer, and I am not a storyteller, so I apologize in advance. But these creatures that I saw were unlike anything I've ever seen. They really reminded me if you crossed a tarantula with a human. I mean, these were gross. They made this hissing, clicking noise, too. I know it sounds phony through email, but it's really hard for me to convey emotion properly, at least through written communication. With all the information coming out anymore about missing hikers and seeing strange figures and shapes in the woods, and all the other bizarre happenings of 2020, I figured, hey, maybe now is an okay time to be open about my experiences and hopefully not experience backlash. Back in 1988, I lived many miles out in the Arizona desert. At that time I worked two jobs and a lot of hours. Each month I worked my schedules out so that I had four days in a row off. During this time I would mess around with my hot rod and race to make a little extra money. I was always doing stuff to my car to improve speed, performance, whatever edge I could get. Well, on one of my days off, I installed a new carb and dialed it in. I always took my car out to the desert to test it. On this particular day, I had worked until evening, but I took it out for a test anyway. So I was having fun testing her out, and it got dark on me. Instead of trying to get back home, I decided to just stay and sleep in my car. I was just driving around finding a place to park and sleep. I came across this old adobe and decided I'd check it out and sleep. It was kind of small and an old ruin. I found an old fireplace inside and it looked more comfortable than sleeping in my car. I grabbed a flashlight, turned on my headlights, and gathered a little brush and some small bit of wood. I grabbed a blanket from my car and an old cushion I had for a pillow. So I built a little fire and settled in. In the morning I awoke early, gathered my stuff, and headed back to an old 1950s trailer where I lived. A friend stopped by to visit later in the day. He had lived in that area all his life and was very familiar with the desert there. So he asks, where was I last night since he had stopped by with some whiskey, but you weren't home. So I told him the story of where I was. When I got to the part about the adobe, he listened. Then he asked about the adobe. I told him where it was and he said that there is no adobe out there. I said yeah, I slept there. He still said no adobe. So I said jump in the car I'll show you. So we drove around and I found the spot, but there was no adobe. My tire tracks were there. I could still see where I built the fire. Everything is there but no adobe. He's quiet as I'm confused looking around. I said to him that it was here last night. He says that he's been here all his life and knows this desert. There has been no adobe here. He says that I went somewhere maybe into the past, but there isn't no adobe here. He's never seen one here ever in his life. So I don't know what happened that night. I wasn't drunk or high and I know it was there. So I looked for it for years but never found it again. Does anyone out there know what happened that night? This happened when I was 15 years old back in 1979. It doesn't matter how long ago an incident like this occurs because once it does, the trauma burns into your brain. I was at Little Pipe Creek in the small town of Flora, Indiana where I grew up. It was just a mile or so from where the creek empties into the Wabash River. My friends and I hung out there every day during the summer. It was late afternoon and we had just arrived at our spot. As we approached the creek, I looked up at a tree about 100 feet away, and there is a figure in it. It had long brown hair, and it was swinging from limb to limb, but it was straight up and down, about six feet tall. I'm there with my two other friends. When I notice the figure, I say, What is that? It's not a monkey, but it's swinging like a monkey, but it's not a human either. 
Back then we didn't know what Bigfoot was and this sighting lasted a good five minutes. We're sitting there watching it. I had no fear in me at all. Then all of a sudden I just had the most fear I've ever felt in my life and I told my friends, we gotta go, we have to go right now. I think the Bigfoot or whatever somehow put that sense of fear in me. The sensation was so sudden and strong. So we take off up the nearby hill and head home. I'm going faster than my friends. I'm up in the weeds and I'm scared and then my friend said, go, 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 a man is chasing us, a man is chasing us. I thought he was joking. I looked around at his face and I've never seen such a look of fear on his face before. We lived about half a mile away and when we got home I go, a guy was chasing us, he goes, well it looked like a man but it was big and hairy. We were scared to return to the spot, but a few weeks later we gathered our courage and walked back to the creek. When we got there it looked like a bomb had gone off. Several of the small and medium sized trees were uprooted and tossed into the creek. But the first thing we noticed as we approached was the unmistakable odor of decay and death. We looked at the destruction as we stood several yards away from the creek. That is when we noticed the source of the stench. There were at least three deer carcasses and several small dead animals strewn throughout the site. We were getting ready to leave after only a few minutes. Then I started to again feel a strong and sudden urge to run from the area. That's when we heard a horrific scream coming from the surrounding woods. We instinctively ran toward home. That was the last time that I ever went back to the location. Several years later, after I had moved away, I ran into one of my friends who had experienced the incident with me. He stayed in Flora, got married, and built a house. He told me that the big hairy man had been seen and reported along Little Pipe Creek by other witnesses. So I don't typically believe this kind of stuff, but I had a strange encounter a while back that I was telling my co-worker about and they insisted I saw a rake. I've been doing some research since I had no idea what his was and it looks very similar to what I saw. Anyway, I was driving home from work at 1.30 am about two months ago and was heading down this typically busy side street, except since it was late there wasn't a lot of traffic, just a jeep in front of me. As I was driving around a bend in the road, I saw in my peripheral this figure to my right by the sidewalk standing between two small trees held up by wire supports. The creature was standing kind of behind them. At first I thought it was just a big slender dog, like a white greyhound or Great Dane that escaped and seemed to be standing and barking at traffic by the sidewalk. I only noticed it as I began to pass by. As I passed by though, I quickly noticed it appeared to have a humanoid-shaped head with black eyes, a hunched back posterior, and a long stretched mouth like it was screaming. I was going about 45 miles per hour when I passed, and it was dark out. I thought to myself, yo WTF was that? So I slowed down quickly to look back, and in my mirror I saw the creature turn around and run towards a wood fence but as it ran I saw how tall and slender the creature was. It seemed pale with a kind of anorexic appearance. It moved strangely and its leg joints were inverted and bent the opposite direction. At that point I was seriously creeped out. The jeep in front of me also slowed down, so I could only assume they saw it too. We both kept driving as it was late and couldn't stop in the middle of the road, but that situation really made my skin crawl. I kept checking my mirrors for the rest of the drive home and debating if I should have called a non-emergency line to have an officer check it out, but I told myself they would think I was an idiot. Now every night when I take that road, I look around to see if I can spot it Ajin. I really want to believe it was just a dog, but I can't stop thinking about how strangely it moved with its backwards knees. I haven't talked about this much except to my co-worker because quite frankly it sounds ridiculous. I'm just wondering WTF I actually saw and if it's something I should even be talking about. Or if I should continue to pretend I never saw anything and just move on with my life.
My great-grandfather did trucking for a while. I also know quite a few drivers. I might do it eventually. I've heard anything from guys being hopped up on Red Bull or Monster Energy and seeing a quote, pink piggy with a tutu dancing in the street in the middle of the night. Whenever anyone saw that it was time to pull off and go to bed, no matter how stretched for time you were, a relative of mine saw some 60-foot icicles somewhere in Virginia. I honestly don't remember where it was. Probably one of the most dangerous was when me and my dad were waiting for a delivery, and it was just after 4.45 a.m. At this point, and the driver called my dad and said he'd hit a power line just down the road. Me and my dad hopped in the car to check on the guy, he's a friend, and he said some hillbilly-looking guy missing a fee teeth came out of nowhere and said, Oh, you ain't got nothing to worry about, that's just a cable line. Cable meaning telephone internet. The guy picks up the line with his bare hands and pulls it off the road and walks off. That was just weird. I don't know if that's what you guys are looking for, but that's the weirdest stuff I got. When I was a graduate student, I needed to travel up into the Arctic Circle in Canada to collect some atmospheric data that couldn't be collected close to civilization. The story that follows is one that I have shared with quite a few people over dinner or drinks, but there's one detail I've always left out when retelling it. This time I'm going to include that detail since it has always bothered me. The facility that was hosting me was a research station 20 kilometer outside of the nearby small town that started life in the 1950s as a rocket launch base. Since then it has fallen in and out of disuse so it has a lot of creepy structures like old rocket gantries and shelters that are eerie, along with a collection of connected main buildings. This place can get pretty busy during the peak season as there are polar bears up there but when I was visiting was decidedly off-peak, and it was going to be just me and two other researchers staying out there full-time. During the day there was also a mechanic and a facility manager, but not a lot of life. The nature of the measurements I was taking meant it had to be done late at night, so I set up my equipment at the beginning of the week and set about running the experiments. It was a slightly unnerving experience going from a thriving university campus to a lost-in-time rocket launch base in the middle of the Arctic, and I had a lot of trouble getting used to cooking meals for one or two in the gigantic kitchen meant to feed an army. I was occasionally talking to the two others at the base, but we mostly kept to ourselves. This meant that by Friday I was starting to get pretty bored. I looked around the room I was using as a research post and behind a decommissioned IM-7D Sparrow rocket in the corner, I found a box of old VHS movies. Score. I rifled through the box and found a few good ones and watched them back to back to get through a particularly dull evening while I waited for the right time to start the night's tests. The final movie I ended up watching was the 1982 classic. The thing which I hadn't seen before but had heard was pretty good. It turns out this was a big mistake, as the movie Spoiler Alert is about researchers isolated in an Arctic base as a body snatching alien monster tears through them. This set the tone for the night as I have a poor tolerance for horror suspense movies, but I figured I would go grab a drink with the other researchers who would often be downstairs grabbing coffee at any hour of the night and then get down to business. I hadn't been down all evening since I had been binge watching crappy VHS tapes, but the complex seemed quiet. No radios were on, there were no movement sounds. A half-drunk cup of coffee sat on the table beside the crust of a sandwich, but the coffee was cold, as was the automatic coffee pot. No one had been here for hours. I thought this was quite weird as researchers usually can't go more than half an hour without a fresh cup of coffee. Seeing as it wasn't too late yet, I decided to knock on the door of one of the other researchers' dorm rooms. No answer. I searched the garage and the other connected buildings, but found no one, only the howl of the wind and strange bumping noises from the metal structure creaking and settling. I reasoned that the other two researchers must be out late finishing some field work and hoped they were all right. 
As creeped out and worried about the others as I was, I had work to do and had to put this out of my mind. I knew that people doing field work took handheld radios with them that had a receiver in the office, so I cranked up the volume to be sure I could hear it in case they needed to get a hold of the base which was me at this point. I set to work on my evening data collection that was going to last from just after 10.30 p.m. until about 3 a.m. on this particular run. The first two hours were uneventful in terms of both the scientific data and in terms of the situation at the base. The only change was that a strong wind was whipping up outside, meaning that ice crystals were filling the air and visibility was maybe 10 meters. I was getting very worried about whether the other two researchers were going to get back safely. Shortly after 12.30 things started to pick up on the scanning equipment, and the same events that caused the northern lights started to cause activity. Sadly, I couldn't see the northern lights as the driving wind had whipped up too much ice into the air. My equipment could still detect it though, so that was a small victory. As I started to write down the time and intensity information in my log for the particularly strong 1248 event, from downstairs I heard KSHRKT. I jumped, breaking the tip of my pencil and tipping the chair over. I felt silly for jumping at what was probably just someone slamming a door, but when the clatter of the chair falling subsided there was nothing again. Only the wind. I tentatively went downstairs to see who had come in, but there was no one and no snow or water on the floor. No one had entered the main door in hours. I stood stock still and listened carefully for five solid minutes, but heard nothing but the wind. No movement anywhere in the connected buildings of the base. I hate an event without an explanation, so it took me a long time to make myself head back upstairs and resume logging data, but no sooner had I done so than I heard someone shout something like, Og. My hair stood on end, I had goosebumps all over. I could tell from the way their shout sounded that they were in one of the outlying buildings attached to the main base by sheltered hallways. I shouted hello back as I walked downstairs, but coming to a stop by the garage door I heard nothing back. Once again just the wind howling. At this point I was truly freaked out and having watched the thing just hours earlier was not helping. I went into the garage and grabbed a short length of square steel tubing like a club. I spent the next 40 minutes slowly and methodically making my way through the base's buildings. I didn't find any water or snow at any of the entrances, no footprints or other signs of entry, and no signs of life anywhere. There was nobody here but me. I went back up to my work area, set the metal bar down on my lap, and basically just stared at the doorway until dawn. The scientifically interesting events were over, and I dared not turn my back or sleep as I had a creeping suspicion that there was someone else in the base that meant to do me harm. The next morning I finally got out of the chair and did another walk around, and just like the night before I found absolutely nothing that indicated that anyone else was there. I was decidedly freaked out about the shouts I had heard the night before and the fact that the other researchers hadn't returned. I knew going outside this time of year was dangerous because of polar bears, but I risked it and took a perimeter walk around the base anyway just to see if I could spot signs of the others. I found nothing. Pure beautiful empty arctic desolation everywhere with the ancient launch buildings in the distance. No tire tracks, no footprints except my own. Not a damn thing. I ended up staying up all day and night Saturday as well and thankfully there were no more unexplained shouts from distant parts of the complex. I was able to play some TF2 with a friend to relax a little, which was helpful, but I was sad to let him go as I was still completely on edge. There were also no signs of the other researchers whom I was afraid were lost dead at this point. I wrote down everything that had happened as I was sure that when the manager showed up on Monday, they were going to be pretty damn suspicious of the new guy claiming the others disappeared without a trace. I finally crashed on Sunday, a nervous sleep-deprived wreck. I still took the time to stack shit on the stairs leading up to my room, put a dresser against the door and took my trusty steel bashing bar to bed with me like a teddy bear. Monday morning bright and early the other staff showed up, 
and to my extreme surprise, so did the missing researchers. It turns out that they had taken an unplanned trip into the city for the weekend, and no one had bothered to tell me that I was going to be solo at the base. I was quite relieved that they were okay, but I was still really disturbed by the noises I had heard as there was no freaking way I had imagined them. In retrospect, the noises were very likely caused by the same phenomena I was observing in the atmosphere. When a strong event happens, it can disrupt radio communication, bounce signals around, or trigger some old radios to detect a carrier and blast static. It's quite likely that the noises I heard were that damn radio I had turned up triggering when those strong events happened. All told, I was glad things turned out the way they did, that the other two researchers were safe, and that the noises I heard were probably just the radio embellished by my dumb decision to watch a horror movie about people in the same damn situation. That said, I was still very glad to be out of there the following day, as there was one detail to the experience that just did not add up. Remember that cup of cold coffee and crust I mentioned earlier? It got tidied up sometime on Sunday, as it was not there when I got up bright and early Monday. Now granted I was sleep deprived and stressed the hell out, but I do not remember touching it. In fact it goes against my philosophy on such matters that people should clean up their own messes. Each of the two researchers, the manager and the mechanic, all said they were in town from Friday night until later in the morning on Monday, so it wasn't them. But I am also pretty damn sure that it wasn't me. And that bothers me to this day. I was standing next to the recreation center on Thetty's Lake with my friend Gordon P., when we saw it a scaly creature emerging from the lake and moving onto the shoreline. The sight was terrifying, just as we had described to others. The creature had a roughly triangular shape with dark, bulging fish-like eyes and a mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth. A spike protruded from the top of its head, adding to its menacing appearance. We estimated its weight to be around 120 pounds, standing at about five feet tall and five feet wide. Overwhelmed by fear, we quickly turned and ran for our lives. With its webbed extremities propelling it forward, the creature pursued us relentlessly until we were a safe distance from the lake. Unfortunately, it managed to catch up with Gordon, causing a deep gash on his hand with its sharp, pointed head. Still trembling with terror from our encounter with the monstrous amphibian, we hurriedly made our way to the nearest Royal Canadian Mountain Police Station. We recounted the incident to the officers, showing them the cut on Gordon's hand that was inflicted by the creature's razor-sharp fin. The authorities recognized the sincerity in our story and immediately initiated a search more like a monster hunt in Thetty's Lake. However, despite their efforts, no trace of the creature was found during the investigation. The case was nearly dismissed until four days later, on August 23 of the same year, at approximately 3.30 in the afternoon. Russell Van Nice and Mike Gold came forward with their own sighting of the creature from the opposite side of Thetty's Lake. Unlike our encounter where we were pursued, this time the creature simply emerged from the lake, glanced around, and submerged itself back into the water. Van Nice and Gold described the creature's face as resembling that of a monster, with a humanoid body standing at least five feet tall. Its skin was silver-colored and covered in scales, while a sharp point jutted out from its head. The creature's ears were unusually large, and its eyes sent shivers down their spines with their horrifying appearance. I'm from Victoria, British Columbia, and my story is from there. A couple of years ago, I was going to art school, and I had a part-time job at a grocery store. Part of our art lessons was to go out into various parts of Victoria and draw buildings and such, things like that. So one field trip we had, we went to a grave site, and we started drawing tombstones and stuff. I remember I sat down and I started drawing this tombstone and there was a lady's name on there. Anyway, I started drawing it. 
A couple weeks later, I'm working at the grocery store, and I'm pretty much the only one there. It's a really small grocery store, and I'm sitting there with another cashier, and in walks this lady, and I can't see her because I have my back to the door, but the other cashier that I was working with, we were talking blah 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 and she looks at me like she was so freaked out. So I turn around and I look and I see this weird looking lady with this long black dress on. I'm totally not lying. She was wearing this long black dress, long scraggly hair, gross looking skin like gray grayish tone and I'm northern so I can tell people skin tones. Anyway she freaked me out so much. Like that was not what regular people look like so I screamed and ran away. That was like my first instinct to just scream and run away. I couldn't believe it. Once I realized that I had screamed and ran away from this lady, I just realized I'm supposed to help. I went back, composed myself and I said, can I help you? She said, I don't know where I am like in this really creepy voice. So I was so freaked out by this lady. I looked at her. I was really close and her eyes just looked like they were held up with toothpicks like it was just bugging out of her face. So I said, you don't know where you are, let me call you a cab. So I said, what's your name? She said, it's Elizabeth. And just a couple weeks earlier when I was drawing this tombstone, I remember what the name of that lady was. And this fresh pile of dirt over there and it looked like a fairly fresh grave and the name was Elizabeth. I was so freaked out by this lady. I mean she did not look like she was walking. It looked like she is floating. She had no footsteps at all. It shook me up so much. It's been like five years and I still get creeped out when I think about her. I don't know if I had just seen that parallel between the living and the dead, but that person that I saw that hovered at me was not human. As a long-haul trucker, I've encountered my fair share of unusual and eerie situations on the road. One incident that still sends shivers down my spine happened around six years ago when I was driving along with a friend. We found ourselves on a desolate mountain road far from civilization. Little did we know, this journey would introduce us to a chilling encounter that would forever haunt our memories. As we cruised along the winding road, engrossed in our conversation, my friend suddenly interrupted with an urgent tone in his voice. He told me to pay attention to the truck driver who had just passed us, gesturing wildly as if warning us not to stop. Intrigued by his urgency, I turned my gaze in the direction he pointed, catching a glimpse of the truck disappearing into the distance. Curiosity peaked. I kept my eyes peeled searching for any signs of danger or unusual activity. And then it happened. A few moments later, I noticed a figure on the side of the road. It appeared to be a woman hunched over something, her silhouette barely visible in the darkness. The image was fleeting as we were quickly approaching a bend, making it difficult to discern any details. My friend, however, had a clearer view and immediately relayed his observations. He insisted that the woman was eating something from the ground, possibly roadkill. The thought alone was enough to send a shiver down my spine. But what disturbed my friend even more was when the woman turned to look at us as we passed by. The chill that crept up my spine intensified and a sense of unease settled over us. The whole situation seemed inexplicably unsettling, leaving us with more questions than answers. Who was this woman? What was she doing in the middle of nowhere, feasting on something on the roadside? And why did the truck driver feel compelled to warn us? As we continued our journey, the image of the mysterious woman stayed etched in our minds, lingering like a haunting presence. I am a 20-year veteran in the Force Service. I've worked as a ranger now for 12 years. My time and in all my time working for the government, I've never encountered anything out of the ordinary. That is until my last station job as a ranger at Gooseberry Falls State Park in Minnesota. It was quite possibly one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had while on duty and certainly not something I'll ever forget. Well, to explain how it happened, we need to go back about six months before that incident. 
I had been planning on retiring. My son had just graduated college and was looking to move closer to Minneapolis. So once he made the offer that he would work part-time with me while he looked for a full-time position, I decided to pass up retirement and stay on the job. By the way, I should make a note that this was all pre-covered. I had heard rumors of management positions opening up in the area. So after discussing it with him, we both agreed that he would come back home for around six months while I waited for the opportunity to present itself. I was first introduced to Gooseberry Falls State Park during my orientation as a ranger there, and they took us out into the park at night time. It was an amazing sight getting to see all these bright campfires down below from way above on top of the waterfalls. The rocks around the falls are very smooth and slippery due to years and years of erosion. You have to be careful if you want to climb down to view the falls at night. Our group had just finished our tour and was going to head back towards our cars when one of my co-workers, Tom, suggested that we climb down the falls, just you know, for the sake of it. I agreed and we should have known better, and so did a handful of others who were nearby. As soon as we began climbing down, I sensed something wasn't right, but being fearless, I pushed those feelings aside as nothing more than nerves. It started out easy, everyone traveling downward in a single file behind each other, staying close and yet far enough apart for safety's sake. Then, around three quarters of the way down, things began to get a bit more dangerous. Tom fell. I didn't see him do it, but I heard the commotion. One of my other co-workers had seen what had happened, yelling up to us that he needed help getting Tom back up the rocks. Two guys rushed down to assist in whatever way they could, and while Tom was being helped back up, one of my female friends called out for help above him, saying she was slipping. It turns out that one part of the path she had been on had been walking, had gave way underneath and sent her tumbling downward. While this may have been scary in and of itself, what happened next could only be described as something straight from a horror movie. We're all standing there in shock at what had just happened when I heard the sound of movement. I looked up, and there at the top of the ridge was this figure with long dark hair watching me. It was terrifying. It was in all black and had these faint yellow glowing eyes. It was in that moment that I felt my entire body give way as if I suddenly lost control. The next thing I knew, I too was falling down to the grounds below me. Everybody rushed over to help save me, and one guy managed to grab hold of my hand while another wrapped his arms around one leg for whatever little good that did. They tried pulling me back up, but there was no use. I looked down below and I could see there were people trying to help my friend, though they weren't having much success. I knew then that we were all going to die right here on these rocks if somebody didn't do something fast. That's why I remember the park ranger telling us about one of the waterfalls in this area called Lucifer Falls, which for some reason nobody had ever been able to find after climbing down to view it at night. It was said that once you get close enough, you could hear voices, supposedly spirits, whispering your name from below. Now, what is most troubling about this story is not so much what happened to me and my co-workers, but what happened with Tom and the female friend as they were being pulled back up to safety, before either of them can make it out of the water completely, we noticed that their eyes had turned from their normal state into a solid black. It was like at this moment that my two co-workers realized that they were struggling with weren't actually Tom or the girl. I'll never forget hearing one of them scream as he pointed downwards towards whatever our friends had become. The other one, just before Tom and his girlfriend can pull themselves completely up onto the rocks, let go with both hands, jumping back down into the water below to avoid capture. We watched him swim off in the opposite direction, but by this time there was nothing we could do to save him. We never did find out what happened to any of them after that day. I can only assume they were captured and are now being used as some sort of test subjects for whatever their reasons may be. Just looking at my own hands now, I can still see the long dark hair growing on them like I saw that day. That's why I'm warning you all not to venture down this path at night. As a matter of fact, it might be best just to stay away from these woods entirely during nighttime hours like we should have. 
Whatever it is that inhabits these lands does not seem too keen on having people wandering around here at night. But if you are, be careful, for you may soon find the woods themselves can't tell the difference between friend and foe. So back in high school when I lived in my hometown, I used to go stargazing at night by hiking into the hills. One of my favorite points overlooked a large housing tract on the north side of the town, but was relatively secluded with how the hills formed a crest line above these residences. More importantly, this crest line blocked a significant amount of light pollution and allowed for better star viewing. So one night, I took a friend with me up into the hills to go stargazing. She and I were pretty alright friends, but I mostly asked her along because I preferred not to be alone out at night if I could help it. Plus, I was definitely feeling down and needed someone to talk with about how I'd been feeling lately. So while we're stargazing, she and I got to talking and eventually I really broke down and cried. We had probably been up there at least a few hours, so it was really late at this point, and we were about a mile up in the hills. So as I'm calming down my friend gets really quiet. I notice she's staring up into the peaks of the foothills and I follow her gaze. And up behind the peaks I suddenly noticed there's an incredibly dark patch in the sky. Now to elaborate a little, at this point I wasn't on drugs or drinking or in any way hallucinating. In fact, at the time, I really prided myself on always relying on rational and reasonable explanations for phenomena in the world but this was something otherworldly. The best I can describe this thing was as a relatively large, dark patch, seemingly spherical in shape, but also with something more angular orbiting its center, as though the orbiting object was turning itself end over end, while the central gyroscope-like center was flying in a wide arc around the foothill mountain tops. It felt as though it was relatively close, as these foothills are not particularly tall, but was entirely silent. She and I watched the thing fly for a few minutes, whereby it dipped behind some hills and never resurfaced. I will say we definitely saw it weave its way around some peaks, so it wasn't just something tethered and certainly wasn't something floating without direction. The thing had deliberate, slow movement, always turning end over end around that inner sphere circle like object. It wasn't easy to see because of the low light conditions but the stars and hills provided some backdrop to distinguish the figure from the background. Now, logically, we both agreed that there had to be an explanation. Our hometown features a reserve Air Force base, and it is possible that it was something for meteorological purposes or even something more stealthy from the base. But to this day, she and I have no idea what we saw in those hills. After that object dipped away, we promptly hiked back to our car and drove off. We kept talking about it for the rest of the night, freaking each other out with alien stories about potentially avoiding being abducted, but to this day I maintain it was probably military related. Anyway, that's my UFO story. I have a number of other Hicken camping stories too, but this one seemed to be the most creepy. Though there was also the time I was on a three-day hike in the desert, found a knife in some rocks on the first day, and then on the second night had the sky open up or reveal thousands of stars due to natural phenomena unbeknownst to me at the time. It was mysterious and amazing when I was in the moment of it though. I drove to a local convenience store here near Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania in Monroe County to pick up something to eat. My dog was with me and it was just before midnight. Everything was normal on the way there, but on the way back something weird happened. As I approach a stop sign outside of town, my dog started growling. My dog rarely growls, so when he does I take notice. I looked around and saw a deer walking toward the road from behind a large oak tree. The deer then stepped out onto the road. It's about 50 feet from me but then the deer starts to walk toward the headlights of my car. As it gets closer, I begin to see its face much clearer. At first, I literally shook my head a bit in disbelief. Then I did a double take. The deer had a freaking human face. 
There was no elongated nose, no big dark eyes, it was a freaking person's face. The eyes had white surrounding dark blue colored pupils and was forward setting, looking directly at me. I just froze. I don't even remember if my dog was growling at this point. I was truly scared by what I was witnessing. It kept looking at me for almost a minute. Then to turned and slowing walked to the other side of the road and then walked off into the woods. I stepped on the gas and got the heck out of there. When I got home, I immediately went inside my house and pour a stiff drink. I needed to know what I saw and went online. I stayed up most of the night looking for an explanation for what I had witnessed. I read a few other accounts of what people referred to as not dear, but nothing as dramatic as what I saw. I'm beginning to believe that I witnessed the results of an experiment that went wrong. I found your contact email during my research online. Can you give me an answer as to what I saw? The day was Monday, June 26, 2023. I saw a Sasquatch in 2003 cross the Foothills Parkway outside of Maryville, Tennessee. It was huge. The smell it left was a cross of skunk, dead carcass, and swamp mud. It had to be nine feet tall, with shoulders as wide as four feet, stringy hair, but you could see the muscles underneath flex as it moved. Its thighs were round as a tree trunk, hardly a neck to it and a cone-type head. Long arms, I would describe it as a half-gorilla and half-Neanderthal man-type animal. I never gave a second thought to a Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or whatever until then. I do not care to see another ever again in person. People are stupid trying to track these animals down. I was off duty when this happened, but I was also in my uniform still and in a police car. I was driving to the gym and I get a call from dispatch saying there was an officer down at the local high school where a kid had been stabbed by another student. This made me drive faster since any school violence is extremely dangerous for anybody involved. Even though I'm off shift, I feel like it's my personal duty to attend. As I'm pulling into the parking lot, which is adjacent to the football field, I see a massive black figure running along the fence line about 15 feet off the ground. I had to do a double take. It looked like two legs, but then there were four. It looked almost human, but too big. Its arms were outstretched, as if trying to climb or something, or just stretch out. It then leapt from one side of the fence to the other effortlessly, which made no sense. It was easily 10 to 15 feet in the air. It then ran over to the top of the car, and I have no idea what or who this thing was, but it let out this strange guttural yell that made my skin crawl. I can write all of this up in my report when I get back, but I don't think they'll believe me. I figured I would submit this anyway because it's been too long, and I still remember this thing vividly. I'm a cop, my zone partner, and I park our patrol vehicles at the bottom of a long dirt road that leads to an abandoned school. We only do this on night shift when it starts to get slow around 1 a.m. It's a relatively safe place for us to catch up on paperwork or watch some YouTube. We have had several odd experiences there, from strange lights that maneuver quickly in the woods to possible UFO sightings. We even found a body down there years ago that still has not been identified. But that's not even the most terrifying. This was around October of 2022 p.m. It was a dead night, crime was low that time of year partly because of sea and partly because it was cold. We had parked our vehicles side by side, facing opposite directions so that the driver's side windows line up. This is common as our line of work. My partner gets dispatched to a noise complaint and leaves. I use this time to step out to relieve my bladder. As I'm standing outside, I hear a whistle in the woods that are across the abandoned school grounds. These woods are roughly 100 yards from where I am parked. The whistle was a tune like it came from a human mouth, and it was oddly loud. 
We do have a homeless problem in my city, but not in the area I patrol. But, I assume a homeless person must have wandered their way to the south side of the city. I get back in my car and roll my window up, anxiously awaiting my partner's return. My partner returns after about 20 minutes. I tell him the story and we move on to other topics. I'm a believer in the paranormal, but he is a skeptic. Within about 30 minutes, he decides that he needs to pee. So he steps out and walks to the rear of his patrol car. He's back there for roughly five seconds. And boom, we hear it again. A loud whistle to the tune of a slow song. The whistle lasts for maybe 10 seconds. He walks back to my window and his face is a pale milky white. So as cops do, we decided to investigate. We grab our flashlights and start walking slowly through the field. That grass is up to our waist. We get to about halfway in the field when we hear it again, but this time it sounds like it's coming from our right side where the school is. As we are standing there with our flashlights shining on the school, we begin to see the grass start to move. There is no wind, the grass is not moving around us. It looks like something is crawling in the field. The grass is moving slow in a straight path towards us. We begin walking towards the movement. At this point we both have our hands on our firearms. The air is eerily still and you could see our breath from the cold. I can tell that my partner is uneasy. We are walking very slow and quiet. As we get about 20 feet away from the moving grass, it stops and we hear the whistle coming from exactly where our flashlights are shining on the now still grass. Now we are frozen in fear, we are too scared to speak to each other. It feels like minutes pass, but was probably only a few seconds. I go to take a step forward and all of a sudden the grass starts to move again. This time away from us towards the wood line. Only this time it's fast, too fast for us to run after. So we just stand and watch. We watch as the, the moving grass reaches the woods. We both have our lights focused on it. And again the whistle. Coming from the woods where the grass just stopped moving. Only this time the whistle is quiet. This is the part that shocks us. We are now shining our lights into the woods. There are several large trees in our view. This thing stands up. It looked like a child. But not. It's hard to explain. Despite our lights shining directly onto the figure, it seemed amassed in darkness. Before we could even call out, it stepped behind a tree and was gone. We gathered up the courage to go after it. As we get to the tree, there is nothing. No footprints, no leaves crunching like you would expect to hear in autumn. It was like it vanished into nothing. We spent the next hour checking reports for missing children in the area, and we could find nothing. The creepiest part is that it must have been running on all fours when it was in the grass. We have a children's psychiatric hospital in the city, but they had no reports of escapees. To this day we cannot explain it, and to this day we continue to park there. Three years have passed and we never had another experience like that. But my partner is now a believer, and everyone at the department thinks we are crazy. I was stationed at Fort Irwin National Training Center, an army post not very far from Death Valley in the Mojave Desert. It was a pretty big post with family housing and such, so not quite secluded. I was Air Force attached to a direct air support unit at Fort Irwin. Our maintenance compound was on the edge of the post. Our actual shop was fairly secluded. I had stayed late at work one winter night. When I shut down the shop, I turned off all the lights and stepped outside. There was a winter overcast thing going on, with so much cloud cover sitting so low that it was almost a fog. No moon, no starlight. And since there were no exterior lights in this area, it was extremely dark. It was so dark that I had to sort of feel my way to the car. I had to feel the door to find the keyhole for my key. This was back in the early 90s, and I had an older car without the automatic door lock. Of course it didn't help that I had stepped out from a brighter area into the night, so my eyes hadn't adjusted yet. 
I just didn't think it was a big deal as soon as I got into the car, started it, and turned on my lights, everything would be fine. So I got into the car, shut the door, put on my seatbelt, and started it up. I then turned on my lights. There in front of the car, sitting peacefully, alertly watching me, was a coyote. Looking around, I see another three or four coyotes staring at me, lounging around like they were in their living room. I had walked right between two of them to get to my car. I jumped. I may have squeaked a little grunted in manly concern out of surprise. I stared at them. They all stared at me in a sort of bored interest. Then I put the car into gear and went home. From then on, I brought a flashlight to work, just in case. As a retired police officer, aged 58, I returned home with my wife on April 18, 1996 in Wamarin, Queensland. Stepping into our house, a peculiar smell of sulfur filled the air, catching my attention. Intrigued, I began investigating, but found nothing visibly out of the ordinary. Meanwhile, my wife proceeded to the main bedroom, turning on the lights in the hallway and the bedroom itself. She then made her way back towards the living room at the other end of the house. Curiosity getting the better of me, I followed along the hallway, approaching the spot where Jenny, my wife, had just passed. Suddenly, I walked into an area enveloped in an intense coldness. As I reached out to touch it, a strong electrical current surged through me, causing me to stumble backward in shock. Overwhelmed by a sense of revulsion and fear, I quickly retreated to the entrance of the hallway, attempting to regain my composure. Jenny, curious about my experience, ventured along the hallway herself and encountered a similar phenomenon. Undeterred, I gathered my courage and made another attempt to walk down the hall, only to be met with yet another jolt of electrical discharge. Jenny and I discussed the situation at length, repeatedly trying to pass through the area, but encountering the same electrical discharge each time. Throughout this ordeal, a presence seemed to linger at the southern end of the hallway. Our toy poodle sensed that something was amiss, and I noticed that when I gazed down the hall, the guanine at the back of my eyes reflected a strange bright orange color instead of the usual vibrant green. The presence of this entity emitted a sensation similar to static electricity, causing goosebumps to erupt on our skin. The area where the entity resided was exceedingly cold and discomforting. Direct contact with it drained us of energy momentarily and made normal breathing difficult. Later that evening, at around 8.30 p.m., our son Adrian and his partner Petra arrived. Eager to investigate, Adrian entered the hallway and experienced the same electrifying discharge. By that time, the entity had moved approximately 8 meters now positioned at the northern end of the hall. Petra, who was heavily pregnant, encountered the entity, feeling as though she had been brushed or lightly struck, but thankfully unharmed. As time passed, all four of us had multiple direct encounters with the entity, which seemed to move with purpose throughout our house. Petra's encounters were less intense compared to the experiences of the other witnesses. At 9.30 p.m., the entity forcefully ejected Adrian from a chair. Jenny had a severe accidental direct contact with it, momentarily becoming trapped within its grasp. She displayed visible signs of distress, struggling to breathe, an elevated pulse rate, weakness, and disorientation. We checked the surroundings of the house but found nothing unusual, except for a column of warm air at the southern end. Throughout this period, no discernible traffic or external sounds could be heard within or around the house. Adrian later had another intense encounter with the entity, after which he and Petra decided to return to their own home. Around midnight, we witnessed a ball of light energy pass across the screen of our television set. An independent witness confirmed seeing a massive orange light suspended above our house at precisely 12.20 a.m. A neighbor reported that her house trembled and shook during that time, while telemetry from the water storage reservoir across the road inexplicably crashed and then restored itself. We also heard loud clicking sounds in groups of three repeatedly resonating throughout the house. 
In the days that followed, some of us developed symptoms resembling radiation sickness, including severe headaches, flu-like symptoms, sore eyes, and joint pain. Three of us experienced chronic and permanent tinnitus. Furthermore, I noticed a brown pigmented stain on both of my legs and a circular mark on the top of my left foot. Several rocks in our garden showed signs of energy impact, with one even exploding into a fine powder. A candle had melted selectively, separating the steric acid component and crystallizing it. Moss on the concrete path exhibited burn marks, and two small sections of the path appeared to have melted or glazed. Additionally, two of the witnesses, including myself, began developing substantial psychic abilities. The events that unfolded within our home during that time left us bewildered and forever changed, haunted by the mysteries of that night. Solo distance cycling through rural Minnesota a few years ago probably 40 miles from anything except cows and corn. Midday, I stop off in an old family cemetery plot in the middle of nowhere to drink Gatorade and smoke a bowl. Sitting stoned in the shade and taking a moment to relax, I distinctly smell cigarette smoke I don't smoke tobacco. I am alone to the horizon in every direction and I turn in around and there is a full cigarette smoking in the overgrown grass right behind me. I know deep down there was probably a rational explanation, but I choose to believe that some lonely old farmer ghost just wanted to chill in the shade and have a smoke with someone. I've spent the last year traveling and working around the outback. One night in far western Queensland, I was driving between two towns about 360 kilometers between the two and being Australia, there is sweet F all in between when I spotted a headlight coming the other direction. As I got closer, it appeared to be only a single headlight, so I assumed it was a motorbike. And then I drove underneath it. I nearly shat myself, I was that startled. I jumped on the brakes and swung around, got out of the car about 100 meters down the road and walked towards it. This pulsating light about 20 feet above the ground and about 30 centimeters in radius. Being probably the only human being for 50 kilometers in the middle of the desert at 1130 at night, I will tell you it freaked me the F out. I recounted the events to a bunch of locals the next day and they said it was a known phenomenon known as the Min Min. And as far as I'm aware, there is no real scientific explanation. Ever since then, oncoming cars became a lot more interesting. When I was like nine or ten years old, my mother and my grandmother, we all went on a picnic out in the country to this lake. It was getting dark and we decided to leave. My grandmother took the wrong turn and she didn't realize it. We were traveling down this dirt road for a long ways. She realized that we had gone the wrong way and we pulled up to this driveway. By this time it was night and there was a glowing pillar that we noticed off the side of the road. It was like a bluish white pillar and we started driving up closer to it and I remember my mother started screaming back the car up and she started beating her hands on the dashboard and we could see that it was an apparition of a woman and it was drifting towards the car. And so we got the heck out of there. All three of us seen it. I, as the witness in this unsettling incident, consider myself a level-headed and respected individual. It was upon returning home that I noticed something peculiar, a bright green, coin-like circle hovering in the air above the refrigerator. Initially, I dismissed it as a portable flashlight accidentally left switched on by my wife. However, when I inquired about it, she denied any involvement. My gaze returned to the mysterious green light, and to my astonishment it seemed to be growing in size and intensity. Suddenly, the object began to move, performing intricate circular motions as it flew around me in a bewildering trajectory. Heat emanated from the light, accompanied by an eerie whistling sound. 
To my disbelief, the green light expanded further, transforming into the shape of a human-like head. Overwhelmed, I feared that my sanity was slipping away and turned my face to the wall, seeking solace in prayer to Allah. Despite my fervent prayers, when I cautiously glanced over my shoulder, the image persisted before me a humanoid form covered entirely in dense fur, resembling an ape. It stood tall, with powerful shoulders and a muscular physique. Its single eye, positioned in the middle of its forehead, emitted a penetrating red beam akin to that of a flashlight. The entity lacked a neck, and its head sat squarely atop its robust frame. As the intruder began to float just above the floor, advancing towards the room where my children were peacefully sleeping, panic surged within me. Hastily, I rushed ahead of the entity, reaching my children in time to shield them with my own body. In that harrowing moment, I found solace in prayer once again, beseeching Allah to protect me and my precious children from this hairy monster. The creature floated towards the bed, briefly covering us before picking us up and swiftly placing us back down, unharmed. It then retreated, standing motionless at a distance from the bed. Though the humanoid did not make any threatening gestures, I trembled in sheer horror, hiding my head under the safety of the bed sheets, continuing my earnest prayers. Soon thereafter, the doors creaked and a loud slamming sound echoed through the apartment, awakening my wife. Her presence confirmed the reality of the encounter as she, too, attested to never experiencing any hallucinations. The memory of that night plagued me. The fear of the creature's return and potential abduction of myself and my children lingering in my thoughts. Eventually, we made the decision to move to another apartment, seeking solace and distance from the haunting events that had transpired. I had always been drawn to the quiet beauty of the hills near Silverton. As a park ranger, I was fortunate to spend my days surrounded by nature's splendor. I thought I knew the landscape like the back of my hand, but one incident would change my perspective forever. It started with a phone call from a distressed woman named Linda. She told me that her mother and sister had encountered something strange and terrifying near their home in the hills. She described it as a troll a short, hairy creature that marched back and forth in front of their house. Her family was so frightened that they had fled to a motel for the night. Intrigued and concerned, I decided to investigate. I drove out to their house, nestled in the heart of the hills, and began my search. As I approached the property, a sense of unease washed over me. The air seemed heavy, as if the very atmosphere was warning me to turn back. I pressed on, stepping out of my vehicle and scanning the area for any signs of the mysterious creature. The ground was covered in a thick layer of leaves, which made it difficult to discern any tracks or traces. As I walked around the house, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly, I heard a rustling sound coming from a nearby thicket. Heart pounding, I approached cautiously, my hand resting on the pepper spray attached to my belt. As I pulled back the branches, I was met with the sight of the creature Linda's family had described. It was short, no more than four feet tall, and covered in coarse, matted hair. It stared at me with beady eyes that seemed to pierce my very soul. Then, without warning, it began to march back and forth, just as Linda's mother and sister had recounted. I stood there, frozen in shock and disbelief, as the creature continued its bizarre display. It seemed uninterested in me, focused solely on its repetitive pacing. I knew I had to do something, but what could a park ranger like me do against such an unknown being? Gathering my courage, I shouted at the creature, hoping to scare it away. To my surprise, it stopped and looked at me, its eyes narrowing with curiosity. I took a step forward, my voice firm but shaky. You need to leave this place. You're scaring the people who lie here. The creature tilted its head, as if considering my words, and then, without a sound, it turned and disappeared into the forest. I stood there for a moment, processing what had just happened, before hurrying back to my vehicle.
I work as an inspection clerk for a real estate agency in a medium-sized town mining town. Needless to say, I see a lot of houses. It's worthy noting that a lot of houses are creepy as hell. With big inspections, I could be in the house till it's getting dark out. In my job, I take pictures of a range of categories in an area, for example, walls, ceiling, windows, floor, cupboards, you get the picture. Noises, ticks and tacks are common accurates. I attribute them to the house settling or the roof getting hot and cold, etc. One day, one of the agents comes to me and asks me to go do an inspection on a house she was too freaked out to do herself. This house had my hair on edge the moment I got in the front door. I would describe my feeling as an urge to get out or that I am in danger. From the start, my senses are up in arms. They normally are as I am always aware that someone could come in behind me. I always lock the gates and main doors behind me because of this. Putting my feelings aside, I start my work. Doing the entrance, the dining room, and get to the living room. There is a door to the front yard in the living room, and I note that the windows, door, and curtains fixtures are of an old style, so I note the house must be pretty old. I start by hearing someone's feet shuffling coming from the hallway behind me like the morning in slippers going to make coffee with a yawn type of shuffle. I pause for a bit and listen, but it doesn't happen again, so I go back to work. Down the hallway, there is a mirror at the end with two rooms on my right and two bathrooms to my left. I go into the first room on the right. I notice a strong odor and think it must be the carpet. Turns out it was rotten. A lot of stains on the carpet, and as I'm typing this out, I hear a voice. I thought it was the agent checking up on me, so I walk to the front door and see nothing. So I go back to work feeling a little more on edge. I go back to working marking down the stains on the carpet and this time hear a distinctive no. I stop dead in my tracks and start looking around the room really freaked out. I finish the room and head to the main bedroom. I finish up the room without much happening. In walking out of the room into the hall typing notes on my phone. Out of the corner of my eye I see something that looks like a person in the mirror directly on my right standing at the end of the hall. I turn to the mirror and it's gone. I look down the hall and then nothing. I let out quite a big gasp as this happened and chuckled at myself. Heading into the room in front of me that leads to an entertainment area. I hear the shuffling again from the hall. Now in really standing there listening. The first bedroom's door slams shut. Panicking him, going through the whole house, trying to find someone messing with me. Nothing comes up. I hear a female voice loudly saying, move. This time I heard it. I really just freaking heard that. I start to head to the front door because at this stage my nerves have had it. As I get to the front door, the first room's door that I have opened again slams shut. So now I'm noping it out of the house. I stand outside collecting my nerves to go back in. I say a prayer for myself and go back into the entertainment area. Nothing much happens after that. Just some shuffling in hall as before, but eventually I'm too far to hear it. I finish the inspection and start heading out. Unlocking the front door I hear now, in the same voice. By this point I'm freaking done with this and I just say back, yeah, yeah, in leaving and hightail it out if they're as fast as I could. Later I learned the man staying there had lost his job and wife in the same month. His mother was sickly and in bed most of the time in that first room, hence the smell and the stains. I am unsure if she passed away in the house. All I know is he went missing for four months, not paying rent, and was evicted. The maintenance guy comes comes to me after the work is done, and said dude that house is freaky telling me his guys were telling dim stories about stuff happening like light switches turning on by themselves and moans and noises. The house if now being rented by the mines for their workers. I haven't heard from them yet. I was a Baltimore Police Department detective and at the time, in early 2021, I worked directly out of the northern district in the city. On the night in question, I was in my office at home late at night in suburban Howard County, Maryland. 
I live alone. I often would find myself unable to sleep at night, so I would head to my office to work. That particular night, I was going through a case file that I was working on. Then I heard an unusual noise. It was just different enough from anything I was used to hearing around the house that it caught my attention. Not to mention it was around two o'clock in the morning. It sounded like something heavy was hitting the ground. It was coming from the yard behind the house. I stood up and I cocked my head to the side to try and pinpoint the exact location. But as I listened closer, I realized that it sounded like it might actually be much closer to the house, like right outside the kitchen in the back. I stepped away from my desk and I moved towards my office door. My office was just down the hall from the kitchen. So I opened the door slowly and stepped out to investigate. But first I listened again to be sure I was correct on the direction it was coming from. Sure enough, I heard it again from the area outside the kitchen. I started to make my way down the hallway and as I got closer the noise got louder. I reached the kitchen and I looked toward the door. The noise had gone silent, almost like whatever was making the noise knew I was listening to it. I slowly and very quietly opened the door to the outside. When I did I was shocked at what I was looking at, standing on the patio, moving around and making the noise, was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was about seven feet tall and totally covered in black and reddish brown fur. It had a long snout with teeth protruding at odd angles. The creature turned towards me when the door opened, almost like it instinctively knew I was there. I was totally quiet when I opened the door. The creature quickly focused on me and lunged toward me hissing. I quickly stepped back inside and shut the door. I had to think fast and determine a suitable plan of action. I decided to head back to my office where I hoped to watch it undetected from my office window. I proceeded to look through the window, but it wasn't long before I heard the sounds of the creature breaking into the house through the kitchen door. I pulled out my gun and I aimed it down the hallway as I slowly opened the office door. I could hear, but not see, the creature in the kitchen. I listened as it was moving around with a lot of force and stepping heavily on the wood floor. I could also hear it snorting as it moved about. It sounded like something out of a horror film. I thought that if I just stayed quiet it might just leave, which would have been the optimal outcome. I listened to it for a while while it moved in the kitchen but then I heard it go into the dining room. I could hear glass breaking and furniture being shoved around. It seemed to be very angry. I finally opened my office door all the way and stepped out completely into the hallway. I slowly walked towards the dining room with my gun still raised. As soon as I got close, I peeked my head around the corner. It turned its head towards me and instantly started to growl. It had an angry look on its face with a human-like expression. I sensed that it wanted to tear me apart right there. But instead of rushing and attacking me, it suddenly went silent again. It quickly rushed back to the kitchen and hurled itself out through the back door. I didn't know what to think at that point. On one hand, I was relieved that it had left, but at the same time, I somehow felt concerned that it may return at some point. I decided then and there that I would find out more about this creature. My confusion and fear turned into anger. I wanted to know who or what this thing was and why it had come into my house. I've done a lot of research, mainly online, but it's been difficult to find anything that really matched what happened. I wondered why it came into the house and what it was looking for. The other descriptions online were generally similar it was bipedal, with pointed ears, large yellow-tinged eyes, and canine-like teeth. It also had a very pungent sulfur-like odor that I can still smell in my memory. My research led to your blog and my contacting you. I have many questions and would like to talk. I still live in the same house, but I currently work for another local law enforcement department. I have not seen the creature since that night but I instinctively know that it still roams in my area. I wish to remain completely anonymous and discreet about my encounter.
encounter with the Bigfoot happened when I was 11, which was eight years ago. I lived near Childress, Texas. I was out playing in the backyard against the tree line. I was playing with rocks and sticks. Then I noticed trash leading into the woods, so I started to follow it and picked up the trash. Then all of a sudden I heard leaves crunching and I looked around and I saw a deer just standing there. I didn't bother the deer and continued to pick up the trash. As I was doing so I felt something watching me. At first I thought it was the deer, but I looked and it wasn't looking at me so I kept looking at the deer and all of a sudden the deer looked up and stood there not looking at me but to the left. So I followed its view and I saw something tall and black standing behind some trees. I didn't know what it was so I just watched it and the deer. I kept watching them for about a minute, then the deer took off and once I looked over at the other thing I saw that it was watching me. I didn't feel like I was in danger so I picked up the rest and stood up. I looked around for it, but it was gone I didn't know exactly what I saw, but it felt friendly like it was watching over me while I was picking up the trash. I didn't see it again after that. I still went into the woods to play hoping it would come back, but it didn't. As I've grown older, I'm sure that this black creature was a Bigfoot. I was underway on a submarine. There were about 125 men on board, but I was standing lookout on the surface. So it was just me and a single officer on the bridge. Normally, we would also have a gunner up there, but we were in the about as far from any other human as you can physically be on Earth, over one of the deepest parts of the ocean in the middle of the night. Mind you, in the sail bridge of a submarine, you are 20-ish feet above the surface of the water. Well, on one of my visual sweeps, I notice I cannot see the stern light. I tell the officer, because if the stern light is out, you are breaking the law. Then we both realize the entire boat is slowly disappearing below us. It was a large, slow-moving wave crawling up the ship. When we were at the top of the wave, I put my hand down and touched the water. Again, I should have been more than 20 feet above that water. If that wave had been another 10 feet higher, there is a good chance the officer and I would not be alive. Our self-inflating vests would have gone off and we would have been anchored to the ship by our harnesses, helpless little boys getting dragged along by the ship in ocean. Then we would have crashed against the hull and masts as the wave passed. We immediately called the captain to secure the bridge because of hazardous conditions, and he approved of this. When we got below decks, we found out that the wave had drained hundreds of thousands gallons of seawater through the drainage ports in the sail. This was an otherwise calm night. We were often told to be on the lookout for rogue waves, especially then, because two sailors on another submarine had been killed by one a few months earlier. The only rogue wave I ever experienced I could not see coming till it was at my feet. After years of sailing, this was the night I truly realized what a scary place the ocean could be. I was walking down a little dirt road at daylight. I was elk scouting when I come out into the edge of the clear cut at the bottom of the hill. I just started out where I could see the top, which the road I was on led up when I seen some movement. I watched for a second and could not believe my eyes. At first it almost looked like two bears standing up on their hind legs facing each other. They were at about 300 yards. I put my binoculars on them and I witnessed what seemed to be two young Bigfoot playing. I watched them jump around chasing each other and jump up and hit their hands together for about a minute. Then all of a sudden they both just stopped and walked off together into the thick trees. They were about five and a half feet tall with hands down to almost their knees with long brown hair. They looked just like pictures I seen in Walla Walla Washington sightings like two years later. I was leading my team of Navy SEALs on the top secret mission deep in enemy territory in Iraq. The assignment was clear. Infiltrate a hostile country, gather crucial intelligence, and extract a high-value target, a U.S. 
diplomat threatened by Saddam Hussein's henchmen. As we moved through the treacherous terrain, I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and tension. The adrenaline surged through my veins as we approached our objective. Our team was composed of skilled and dedicated individuals, each with their own unique traits. Among us was Bruce, an exceptional soldier who had a hidden talent. When he wasn't fighting on the battlefield, Bruce would occasionally entertain us with his rock guitar skills during our downtime. It was his way of bringing a touch of normalcy to our demanding lives. As we executed the mission, we encountered relentless opposition from a well-trained enemy force. They were determined to protect their leader and maintain control over the region. It seemed like every step we took was met with gunfire and strategic ambushes. But we were Navy SEALs, trained to overcome any obstacle thrown our way. However, our journey took an unexpected turn when we discovered that the supposed weapon of mass destruction we were tasked to locate didn't exist. It was a false lead, a deception that had led us into this dangerous territory. Doubt began to creep into our minds as we questioned the validity of our mission. Were we being used as pawns in a larger political game? Anyway, that's not why I'm telling you this story, so listen up. During one intense raid on a local house, as we stormed through rooms and cleared them one by one, I found myself face to face with something that defied explanation. In a locked room, I caught a glimpse of a bizarre creature. The only way I can describe the legs of it is like that goat or human hybrid from the Narnia movie, but with the torso like a hybrid of man and canine. It was taller than me, and I'm tall. Its outline and coat were pitch black, blacker than anything I've seen before. Its eyes, piercing and filled with an unknown intelligence, seemed to lock onto mine for a split second before chaos erupted. The creature swiftly tackled me, and with incredible strength, managed to break free from my grasp. It vanished into the chaos of the firefight. As I struggled to regain my composure, confusion and shock overwhelmed me as I tried to comprehend what I had just witnessed. But in the midst of the ongoing battle, I made a difficult decision. Pursuing the creature was not a priority. Our main focus had to be on completing our mission and ensuring the safety of our team. Eventually, we managed to escape the compound with our target in tow, making our way to the outskirts where we were picked up by an army helicopter. As we soared through the skies, I couldn't shake off the image of that strange creature from my mind. When I questioned the other members of the team about it, they seemed puzzled. None of them had seen any such creature during the operation. It left me wondering if what I had witnessed was real, or merely a figment of my imagination in the heat of battle. I have been working as a law enforcement officer in Hancock County, Mississippi, where we have been receiving reports about a large bipedal creature near the Stenny Space Center. I have the unsettling experience of encountering this unknown animal believed to be Bigfoot, and I want to share my account. In my submitted report, I described the creature as a huge being, running on two legs at a speed that surpassed anything I had ever seen. At that moment, my main concern was getting away from there without drawing my gun. It happened after I finished my night shift, around 11.30 p.m. My girlfriend picked me up, and we headed home together. Once she dropped me off, I started driving north on Highway 607 towards Bay St. Louis. As I glanced in my rearview mirror, I noticed headlights of another vehicle behind me. I decided to slow down, hoping the driver would pass me. To my surprise, the vehicle continued to tailgate me with its high beams on. Annoyed, I gestured for them to turn off their high beams, but they didn't respond. To get a better look or note their license plate number, I gradually slowed down and moved to the side to let them pass. However, as I did so, the vehicle pulled up beside my driver's side door. I pulled my car over to the shoulder of Highway 607, thinking I was about to confront an unpleasant individual. But what I saw standing on the roadside was not a man, but an incredibly hideous creature of Bigfoot. 
It walked around my patrol car while I prepared to defend myself, unholstering my firearm. Strangely, the creature showed no signs of fear or aggression towards me. It calmly entered the nearby wooded area, disappearing from my sight. While I am convinced that the encounter was with a Bigfoot, I also want to mention another incident. Inside the buffer zone of the Stenny Space Center, around 3.34 a.m., my patrol car mysteriously died. It was a peculiar occurrence that I will include in a subsequent report along with this new information. I had a normal upbringing. Parents are still married, went to church on Sundays, had a dog, picket fence, all those things. I did a little marijuana in high school, I rarely drink, and there is only one reported case of a mental illness in my family. When I was 12, 13 years old, I remember having a very vivid dream where I was sitting in my living room watching TV. While watching TV, which in my dream I was viewing myself in third person, Something made me want to look out through the dining room and out through the large sliding glass door into the backyard. When I turned my head, it was completely dark outside, and then in almost a comedic way of film. This giant moon slid up from below the horizon like from the 9 to 12 position on a clock. The moon was enormous, almost filling the sky and was brilliantly white. As I sit dumbfounded in my dream staring out the back window, Something pulls my legs out from under me, while I'm sitting on them on the floor. This startled me, but while in my dream I am still staring at the moon, this voice from what I can only assume was in my head said, It's almost over. This frightened me horribly, so much that I woke up hot and sweaty only to find my bedroom door partially open with a small, dark figure closing the door and saying without moving his mouth, Don't tell. I don't recall really any of the small humanoid's features. I just recall him being about two feet tall and seeing the figure's darker than gray complexion, and nothing moved on its face when I heard it speak. Even to this day, this incident is one of the most vivid memories that I have. Seeing your photo of a reptile man was nearly like pulling out a photo of my head from that past memory. I mentioned nothing of this occurrence until just a few years ago to a close friend. I never even told my wife. While I went off to college, came back home, got married, had a couple of kids, and just over a year ago bought my parents' house. On and off since the encounter, dream or incident, whatever you would like to call it because I don't. I get this feeling like I'm being observed. Not the kind of being watched where you are sitting up at night, unable to sleep, and you feel like someone is watching you through the window. More like something is waiting for me as I walk into rooms and sitting in the car with me while I drive to work. This was only in small increments and I never felt it to be constant. But since moving back home, I am feeling it more so. My son is the fun age of five and recently started talking about some guy he met here at home named Kyle Foker. He tells my wife and I that he has seen him all over the house. Yes, he is a child with an imagination. But while giving him the 20 questions over his new friend, I am rattling my brain on what TV show, commercial or movie, he could have come up with this, and so far have come up with nothing. While that is going on, I was in the kitchen just a week or so ago talking to my mom, and for some reason I felt compelled to look the other way, and I saw a dark figure. This figure that I saw had an upside-down triangle for a torso and a rectangular block for a head. When I turned to look, I could tell that it looked at me because while my brain was trying to comprehend what I just had seen, I could see that the block head sort of rotated and proceeded to take an immediate left and zip its way through my stairs that go up to our bedrooms. From everything that I know, no one has died on this property. My grandfather that lived with my parents and I at my current location for a few years while from the time I was six until I was in high school, became ill with Alzheimer's and later passed away, having a complication from a stroke at a hospice center. But I am afraid partially for my sanity, but more for my family. Although no one has been hurt in any way, I can't help to think like a father or husband and want to protect my family from any possible threat. 
But my issue here is that what the hell am I dealing with? Possible alien thing, spirit, mental illness, or all of the above. Am I seeing one thing and my son is seeing something else? Our incident took place in January 2017. We had just moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. My wife and I were newlyweds from a small community in the Midwest. Being naive and new to living in the city, I would answer the door without giving it a second thought. Never again. There were several loud knocks at 6 a.m. in the morning, which was unusual, and it should have dawned on me to be cautious. My wife and I had been getting ready for work, a pretty regular routine. The moment I opened the door, I was feeling a strange rush of fear and foreboding. There stood a teenage boy, of average height and build with a black leather coat, black hair and sunglasses. The sunglasses at 6 a.m. struck me as odd. Then I noticed he was eating a pear. He simply asked if he could come in and warm up. I said, sorry, but no. I closed the door and slid the security chain into place. A few minutes later, another knock. I opened the now chain door, and before I could speak, he asked again if he could come in and warm up. I replied, no, and attempted to close the door. Before the door could shut, he put his hand out and abruptly stopped the door as if he had no issue with getting his fingers smashed against the frame. He looked at me, still wearing his sunglasses, and said, Can I at least get something to wipe my hands? I said, Get the hell out of here. My wife is calling the police. He smiles, lowers his glasses, revealing eyes as black and shiny as obsidian, and says, No, you won't be calling anybody. At that moment, I force the door closed, lock it, and call out to my wife. She was totally freaked out by this time while hiding in the bedroom. I ripped the curtains back to look out the window next to the door. He's gone. Absolutely no trace of him. I go out on the patio and check the gate. It's still latched from the inside. I look up and down the street. Nothing. Then I look down. There is a half-eaten pear lying on the sidewalk. Driving one night, I went down the country road my aunt lived on at the time. She had llamas, and even though they were off to the side, and it was nighttime, I could still see them well enough with the glow of the headlights illuminating to the sides. I could see their fur, the colors and patterns. Right then I noticed in front of my car was a very tall, solid black figure, slim with long arms, and its eyes reflected the headlights. If I could see the fur of the llamas without direct light on them, I definitely know with this thing right in front of me that it had no texture. Just solid black except those eyes. It walked off the road into the woods. We live outside of Houston, Texas. My wife and I were at home and in our backyard. It was a beautiful cloudy day on 10-21-21. I first noticed one cloud stop while the rest moved on. I asked my wife to watch it as well. We noticed a swirl in the cloud until it opened. I'm not sure if it was a portal, but it grabbed my attention. Three figures flew out of the opening and then transformed into human form. They were light-skinned with long hair with fitted outfits that resembled the villainous characters from Superman 2. They hovered in front of the portal area as if to be checking something. We noticed the windows of the craft, which caused us to also notice the doorway of the ship open. We then observed the other beings in the background of the doorway as if they were riding on a train or subway. We saw two of the human-like figures go back inside and walk down a stairway into the inside and fade away as they went down the stairs. The remaining figure began to look at us. We felt the intuition of knowing that they were intentionally showing themselves to us for whatever reason. The last figure flew inside the portal and entered the craft's doorway. He touched the open part of the portal and swiped it with his hand and the portal began to close as if automated. The cloud begins to swirl. It then faded away and simply vanished. 
We remained in the yard and were discussing what we had witnessed. About an hour later, as we were sitting on our patio, a black SUV pulled into our driveway. Two men dressed in all black clothing and sunglasses got out of the SUV and walked toward us. The lead man didn't greet us, but immediately asked if we had reported what we had witnessed in the sky. We were shocked. We responded that we had not reported the event. I then asked them who they were. They didn't answer. They both turned and got back into the SUV and pulled away. That was the last time either of us had seen them. I will mention that the man spoke in a monotone voice that was somewhat high-pitched in tone. Her skin color was weirdly opaque as well. In fact, the two men looked like they could have been twins. I still have no explanation. Do you believe that these were what people refer to as men in black? Back when I was like six, or maybe seven, thirty years ago, I was an unknown predator as a child. Lived in a trailer park, so during the summer, it was literally Lord of the Flies from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. One day, while me and a friend were snooping around people's yards, we found a rowboat behind a shed. The thing was rotted, falling apart, and just not fit for use. But my friend got all excited and said he knew where a lake was we could go sailing at. So we grabbed some skateboards and two by fours for oars and proceeded to stead the boat. It took four hours of dragging it and another two hours of moving it though swamp and forest. But we get to the lake my friend was talking about. To us it was a lake, but really just a pond. We're excited about a job well done and just throw everything into the boat and start rowing out with the two by fours. We get out to the middle of the pond and we started to realize we're taking on water, lots of water and fast. We start to panic because we can't scoop out water faster. Then it's leaking in when suddenly we hear a hollow dumum and scratching sound. The boat was sitting on something and we were no longer sinking but still taking on water. We take off our shirts, socks, and stuff them into spots. We could see water leaking in and finally relax. We can get water out faster than it was coming in. It was then we had a chance to take in the surroundings. It was pretty awesome for a six-year-old, and we're talking about six-year-old stuff for a few minutes. And then I looked down into the water. It was really clear and seemed deep. And then I realized what I could see and what we were stuck on. In the pond, we could see hundreds of 50-gallon metal barrels. They were piled up so high in some places, the boat had gotten stuck on one of them. It was like looking into an alien world with mountains of barrels everywhere. I think I had just seen Return of the Living Dead, which starts with kids opening a 50-gallon barrel and releasing the undead I think so I was freaking out and tell my friend we need to get out fast. So we're panicking and getting water out of the boat, and then my friend screams and points down the road, and we both see something worse than undead zombies. The trailer park manager in his truck, flying down a dirt road near the pond and coming right for us. Now it might not sound like much, but this was the guy who got you in serious trouble. Trailer park parents generally didn't care what the kids did. But when he shows up to your house to threaten your parents with being kicked out because of what your kid did, you knew you were in for a memorable beating. He pulled up near the pond and were trying to row away from him, but we were starting to sink again. He grabbed a rope and threw it out to us and pulled us in. We were terrified. We knew we were in for some serious screaming from him and beating from our parents. But he didn't scream, didn't threaten, he just stood there staring at us. He asked us what the hell we were doing out there, that we were trespassing, stealing, and what we were doing was wrong, but not screaming. He was calm, kind of scared, like we got him in trouble. We explained what we were doing there, but didn't bring up seeing the barrels. He questioned us forever, we were six, and then told us he wouldn't tell our parents, which was crazy because he told parents everything he saw and would bring us home if we agreed to never go out there again and to not tell our parents, otherwise he would tell them about all the crimes we committed. 
He dropped us off back in the park, and we never heard anything about it again. One thing that did change was he never was mean to the two of us again, but was a bastard to every other kid. He never told our parents about anything we did wrong, and was never mean or threatening to myself or my friend again. My uncle saw a skinwalker. So as I said this happened to my uncle when he was about my age, I'd say early 20s, maybe 18 or 19. Must have been the 70s in that case. He was out in the Wyoming wilderness tending to a ranch house. Just him and his girlfriend. The owner was out and had him go up to take care of the animals until he came back. A few days in and everything was well. Animals well, uncle well. He decides to retire for the night. Goes in the cabin with his girlfriend. Sun goes down, they pass out. Uncle wakes up to the pitch black and this horrific hypnagogic scream. It was one of those things he later recalls that he hoped he had only dreamed. So he lays there for a bit. Things seem okay. Girlfriend doesn't stir. Tries to drift back off. But before he can another one comes. This time undeniably real. Girlfriend wakes and the dog started barking. My uncle gets up and grabs the shotgun. Heads for the door, but realizes the scream isn't alone this time. Another voice chimes in. Then another, to eventually form what he would later describe as a little chorus of suffering. He starts to back away slowly from the door. And that's when the chanting started. Listening to him tell the story, you'd almost start laughing at this point, unless you were really looking on him, because he was dead serious and full of all those little micro-expressions that happen as you really recall something. He could hear their footsteps creak up and down the small wooden porch of the cabin, the chanting from multiple voices, multiple footsteps. By this time, him and his girlfriend are in a shadow in the corner of the cabin away from the windows and the light of the fireplace, shotgun leveled at the door. He says it felt like forever, animals screaming, them chanting, him shaking, girlfriend crying. In hindsight, it must have only been 30 minutes or so. Then it all stopped. Not all at once, though. One by one, the barking stopped. One by one, the screams stopped. Until the last one, with which the footsteps and chanting came to an end. My uncle sat huddled in the corner, though, for several hours. Eventually, the sky started to brighten with that morning blue against the silhouette of the pines. He waited a while longer until the sun crept over the mountain range before making his way to the window. He had an idea of what he'd see. He'd hunted big game and small game, but this was different. The porch was empty, but the cabin ground weren't. He peeked his shotgun out the front door slowly opened it. There in the morning sun, a nice cool morning, he recalls, birds chirping, air fresh. The ground was strewn with dead animals. Blood everywhere. Everything dead and dissected. Guts and organs strewn about. He puked right there on the porch when the smell hit him. Regaining his composure, he made his way around the animals. An odd detail, he thought in retrospect, were the rubber bands tied around the testicles of some of them. He'd seen enough. Him and his girlfriend noped the F out. They made it to town, called the police and the owner. Not sure what came of it. He gets visibly shaken to this day just when it's mentioned. He says he thinks it was those skinwalkers, but he's a superstitious backwoods hick more or less. I live in Portland, Oregon, but I work at Mount Rainier National Park as a backcountry ranger. I would like to remain anonymous, so please refrain from including my name. On the night of the 5th of September 2015, I was driving home from work after a busy day of trail maintenance on the Ara Loop. I was about 15 miles east of Paradise at about 1.30 a.m., and I was doing about 50 miles per hour. I was driving on the Lewis River Road. It was a beautiful night and I was enjoying the drive. I had my headlights on high beam and was watching my mirrors to avoid deer, as they frequent this area. 
and in the past I've nearly totaled my car in the winter when a large buck jumped out. As I rendered the corner coming out of the forest, I noticed a large dark figure on the side of the road. Now immediately I'm on edge because in my mind, I'm imagining this being a large buck about to jump out from my car, and I could not afford the time to make another car payment. I immediately slam on my brakes because I wasn't sure what was going to happen, and I realized it was not a deer because this thing was standing beside a tree on the road's shoulder. So I slowed down even more. I began to focus what little eyesight I had on this creature, and I could see that it was very, very large, probably about eight feet tall, covered in shaggy long hair that looked very thick and matted. It was hard to tell in the lighting conditions and shadows any real details of the face, but I could tell that it turned to look at me directly, and then stopped and stepped off the road into the field. It was obviously aware of my presence and did not seem surprised by me. They continued to walk away from the road into the field, lumbering on two legs. I'm telling you now it was not a bear because it never walked like one. It reminded me of a person on two legs the entire time, the comfortability of bipedally walking. It walked for about a minute, maybe a minute and a half, before I could not see it anymore. I was in shock, to say the least. I drove very slowly for a minute to see if maybe I could see it again, but I eventually lost sight of it. Even though I was in shock, I did not feel too scared. I did not feel threatened. I was just in total awe at what I just saw. It was so huge and very obviously not a bear or a person in a suit. Why would somebody be out here in the middle of nowhere? It also walked very naturally on two legs. I went back to the spot the next day and measured a tree it was standing beside. That's how I know it was around eight and a half feet tall. I've been a park ranger for the better half of eight years now and have never seen anything like this before in my life. I have had other interesting experiences though in the backcountry, but they were mostly while working and related to the environment. People are always throwing around the term Bigfoot, but I have no idea what this was. I'm ignorant, please excuse me, and thank you for your time. If you can provide any information, that would be most helpful. Thank you again. May of 1985, we were dispatched to a rural area of Placer County, California, investigating some possible dog or livestock killings. The crime was that the owners found their dogs dead in the backyard, and one of their goats was taken from the pen and killed, pulled apart like a piece of chicken. What was strange about this is that any animal abducting goats or hens would generally eat on them, not take their prey and pull them apart and leave the body. When we got there at first we saw nothing, but when we began to walk around by our cars, we could hear something, something breathing pretty heavily, like it was running and getting closer. So we walked around some more and could see what looked like a little person hiding behind two trees, just about 50 yards out, looking at us. My partner actually recognized it at first, that it looked like a human face or maybe a child, but with glowing eyes, crouching down and covered in hair. Then it crouched down all fours and ran away into another tree. I was already shooting at it with my 9mm. It did not move like a human, but like that of an animal. That is when it came out of the tree and was on top of me. The rest of the incident is kind of blurry. However, I do know that nobody could find the bullet casings or even see what I had been firing my weapon. I then took them to where the creature was standing when it ran across the road. They still could find nothing. The people who worked on the case were stunned by what happened. One man said he would later go back there again if need be. He also claimed that he had been feeling something evil in the area for a while now. Take that as far as you want. Later on down the road, we also found some dead cattle in another part of the county. We were told by the owner that he had been having problems with some cattle mutilations and thought that this something that I had shot at was also killing his livestock. I know it was not the same thing because the killings were different. 
Another man who we spoke to had said that this goat that was killed had its stomach completely ripped open just like the others, left there to rot. My report and statement were only taken so far. With this creature having jumped on top of me, I'm surprised it did not kill me, but it did give me some pretty severe trauma that I have to live with. I can tell you that whatever this thing was, it was not a normal human or an animal. This was something else altogether, maybe an unknown species of some kind, something that science probably will deny. I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but the strangest and most unbelievable was what I know I used to see as a teenager. A gnome. It wouldn't have even been as tall as my knee, probably halfway up my shin. It had a red hat and a white beard. He was a typical garden gnome, only he wasn't a statue. I saw him at least a dozen times through our living room window, frolicking about in the garden and along the windowsill outside. I'd sometimes even see his silhouette through the blinds if they were closed on a sunny day. My parents, obviously, always brushed it off as silly crap kids say when I told them what I saw. Oh, don't be silly, or Awa oh, did you? They never paid it any attention, and why would they? I even remember my father saying something to Mum like, We don't even have a garden gnome. And she responded that it was just an active imagination. I lived there until I was about 18 or 19, and I don't even think anyone in our street owned garden gnomes at all. It never even once looked at me, like he didn't know I was watching, or perhaps didn't care. The last time I saw him was about 20 years ago. I'd never spoken about it to anyone but my mother and sister during my adult life, else I'd probably be admitted to a mental health ward. When I asked Mum, she still remembers me talking about him when I was little. Most people reading will probably think what a load, but I promise this is true. Was he real? or possibly a fabricated memory of some kind. Why would my mind make me remember fake stuff? Has anyone else ever seen one? This happened in the western suburbs of Sydney, Australia. I spend a lot of time in Africa both on business and for pleasure. One time there were about eight of us that went camping in a national park in Zambia. I was with a friend and the other six I did not know. There were two other couples and two single females. We spent the afternoon getting to know each other and pitching our tents, had our dinner and retired to our tents for sleep. Around 3 a.m. in the morning I hear the two females freaking out. There was screaming like I have never heard before. To be honest I was shitting myself, I thought some animal was attacking them. My adrenaline was pumping like crazy. I always remember hearing that when people are screaming they are okay, it's generally the quiet ones that you should worry about. So I got my torch and found the courage to open up my tent. At this point the screaming was continuing, and I could now hear scratching noises. The other members of the group were remaining very quiet. I am sure they were just dry-mouthed and did not want to bring attention to their tents. I slowly opened the tent and shone the torch in the direction of the girl's tent, and I saw two hyenas walking around the tent. I know that generally hyenas are generally timid creatures around humans, but they have been known to attack and kill people in rare circumstances. By this time, the guide was out of his tent and simply shouted at the hyenas, and they ran off. One of the golden rules of camping in the domain of wild animals is not to keep any food around. Always keep food in sealed containers and make sure everything is clean and washed properly. It turned out that one of the girls has some biltong dried meat in the tent, and the hyenas has smelt it and were trying to get at it. This happened quite a time ago, but remember the encounter very well. My mom sent me next door to my grandma's to get something for her when the whole time felt like I was being watched, and looked over my shoulder several times. Now the distance between my house and my grandma's was long enough. Where once I reached my grandma's, my home was not visible. The sighting occurred on my way back home. I was about halfway when I saw the creature. 
He was making a lot of noise and came crashing out of the tree line, breaking a huge tree branch. Then it began to run toward me. I remember thinking this can't be happening. I felt like my legs would not move out of fear. It all was in a time span of five to ten seconds. I then ran the rest of the way home, and I tell you I have never ran so fast. The next day I took my mom to the site where the creature had come out of the trees and showed her the tree branch. Lots of people I know do not believe in Bigfoot, so I normally would shy away from telling my story. I do know for a fact that what I saw was indeed Bigfoot. Okay, so I'll try to make this relatively short, so I'm not one for believing too much of cryptid lore. Never had an encounter before or anything like that. But my partner and I live on the border of upstate New York, not far from the Whitehall Bigfoot area. One night partner was taking out the garbage and came back inside startled. I mean really shook up. They said they had seen a creature that looked like maybe a fox or coyote, but that it then stood up on its hind legs and so they booked it back inside. Fast forward about a month and I'm outside on my porch smoking a cigarette, enjoying the stars under a crystal clear sky. We have a small plot next to our house that has a tow behind landscaping trailer permanently parked on it about 20-ish feet away from the house. After a while of standing outside I get the sudden and intense feeling like something is watching me. Just that primal feeling of danger. It should be noted that, like most people up here, I'm usually carrying a gun on me coyotes and bears are fairly common up here, so I kind of do the four corners check of my surroundings. When I looked over to that trailer, I saw there was something the size of a large dog laying in the grass. Mind you, it's a clear night with a not quite full moon, and the grass was uncut long, but not like a meadow. If I had to estimate, I'd say seven, nine inches high. So I had a really good view of this thing. Now I know never to approach a random animal bedded down at night. So I just kind of watch it for a second. Even in the light of the moon, its outline and coat were pitch black, blacker than anything I've seen before, unnaturally contrasting against the ground it laid on. Then it looks up, it has piercing red eyes. I'm thinking, aw, oh, what the F, and put my hand on my revolver. I ain't about to be coyote food. And then, it stood up. It stood up on its hind legs. The only way I can describe the legs of it is like that goat-human hybrid from the Narnia movie, but with the torso like a hybrid of man and canine. It was taller than me, and I'm six foot one. It didn't even need to take a step. I flicked whatever was left of my cigarette and backed away to the door, locked and bolted it, and spent the rest of the night wondering what I just saw. Now I'll admit, I'm a religious man, but that thing didn't fit the description of any gin I've heard of. It's to this day one of the few things in my life I cannot explain we've installed security cameras since but now the lot is under construction and we haven't seen it since. I don't know what I saw that night truly, but I intend to find out one way or another. I want to go into the forest near the plot and look for signs. Does anyone have any advice on hunting this sort of cryptid? I'll update with any further happenings should they appear again. Me and like 10 of my friends went to an abandoned mental hospital in Detroit. We just stood way back and threw rocks at it for a while, while one of us worked up the courage to actually go inside. We constantly are seeing things move in the windows of the building and small lights moving and turning on and off, but eventually half of us say F it, and find the safest way in. We go through where the trucks used to unload into the building and walk down a long hallway. There's a stairwell nearby where we walked in and I heard voices in the stairwell, and no one else heard it but me and my best friend, so we kept moving. We take a couple more turns, stopping occasionally because someone heard something, when soon we come across the most dreaded place we could have found, the morgue cremation room. Tons of graffiti everywhere saying stupid teenager scare tactic shit. Everyone shit themselves when we found that room, 
but we all chilled in it for a while until we inevitably started to leave. As we leave the morgue, it takes you into a hallway where the elevator shafts are, and there is a room across from the door. We exit and me and my friend are walking out first, when suddenly a girl in a white nightgown steps out from the door across hall, and I shit myself. Hoping to cut the silence and maybe get her to react because I was thinking she was like a crazy homeless crack addict, I yelled, oh shit, and she just stood there. Soon after, another guy comes out, then another guy, then another girl whose looks made me think they were actually doing heroin. Collectively, we all just went, what the F, and started talking. They told us to put our weapons down because cops go in there all the time and you're not supposed to be on the property, let alone with weapons. But we just had like scrap metal from the ground. So we put our weapons down and talked to the other group for a second while I was talking to the nightgown girl. And the ringleader, I noticed the cracked out looking one just walk away into the pitch blackness of the corridor behind her. While we all had flashlights, which the kid told us to put those off too but F that idea. We leave, and as we get on the road back to our cars, surprise, surprise, a cop pulls into the road, and we all hit at that point. It was just a couple of us, since some were farther ahead and had made it back to their cars while the cop searched the area with his spotlight. That was a crazy or creepy night. Oh, and later that night at like 5 a.m., a dude followed me in his truck because me and my friends fell asleep in my car across the street from his driveway. So he just shined his brights into my car for like 10 minutes while we tripped out to see if he was going to do anything. Plus, we were high and tired, thus very confused. Once I had stopped at a gas station and got out, they pulled up to the pump behind me and just stayed in their truck. I walked inside to pay for gas came back out to talk to the truck guys, but they left as I was walking out. My master's degree work was looking at stoneflies in coastal Alabama, and it required a lot sampling out in the streams, the habitat for juvenile stoneflies around Mobile Bay. When I went sampling, I'd have to get into the stream and collect five packets of leaves that collected in the stream at random intervals in a 100-meter stretch of the stream. I sampled from June 2012 through July 2013 for two different projects, one that used the same four streams for an entire year and another project that used about 20 different streams in the fall and spring season. When I went sampling, I parked an old Ford Econolian van with a big university sticker on it by the side of the road, near a bridge, then climb down and hop in the stream and go to work. With these streams being out in the woods and some of them being damn remote, creepy stuff happened every so often from metal scrappers asking for any good finds, a decrepit old baby doll in the woods, walking up on a dog grave site under a bridge, a truck stopping on the bridge of a 30-meter wide river terrible place to sample for my work, by the way, and watching me and my sampling partner from a distance, and so many other things I could keep going on, but this is the time I truly felt I was going to die. At the beginning of my field work in the summer, it was easy to coordinate with lab mates to get a sampling partner to make the work easier and safer, but late in the fall to the 12th semester, my main sampling partner had finished her thesis and didn't come to campus much can't blame her, so I started sampling by myself in later November or early December. It added some extra time onto my day, but it made scheduling easier and more consistent and nothing dangerous had happened going solo, so I was good with the change. It was the early spring of 2013 and I was traveling to the second stream of the day hitting a stream I'd seen twice a month for the last seven or eight months. I knew it like the back of my hand and thought I'd seen everything it had to offer. I rolled up about 10 a.m., munching on an apple I had started when I left the previous stream and tossed the apple core into the clearing that I had parked the van in. This stream had a nice clearing off the side of the road, but was a 30 meter or so walk to the stream with a slight decline over eroded dirt and gravel so I couldn't see the other side of the stream. I blissfully rolled up my trusty, punctured chest waders and walked to the trunk, packed up my gear, 
grabbed my sever sampler, a fine mesh net that attaches to a folding base and metal meter stick. I casually stroll down to the stream ready to take my usual piss under the bridge as I do at every stream when across the stream I see a dog. I think it is a border collie German shepherd mix, but I am not that great with dog breeds. I stop in my tracks staring at it waiting to see if its owner will show up from the woods, but mostly debating if I could still piss, but the dog takes the first move. It makes a loud solitary bark and then runs off into the woods downstream. It promptly returns, but it isn't alone. There is another identical dog with it. They don't make any noise. They just stand attentively on the other side of stream staring at me. I can't make out any collars around their neck, but they had a lot of fur. There is about 20 meters separating us since neither of us are that close to the stream bank. The stream bank is relatively high from the water, about two, three meters where the standoff happened and I was on the side with a small steep entrance, so I figured I could get my work done and the dogs would leave me alone. As I'm climbing down, they are mirroring my distance into the stream, but not getting closer to the edge of the stream. I check over my shoulder to still seem them watching me from the clearing and still think I'm fine, so I start walking upstream. The dogs keep following me, but now they enter the forest. These dogs were not frolicking around the woods. They hunched down, hid behind trees and foliage to conceal themselves, and were dead silent. I couldn't hear them move over the sound of the stream. This is when I am proper spooked. As I kept going and they kept following me, I started to move closer to the opposite bank as often as could, and was walking slower than usual in the shifting sands and rushing water, making sure that I didn't lose my footing. Every five meters or so, I would stop to locate them, but there were several times that I lost where they were. I didn't need to see them to feel their eyes out in the woods. Over time, they stopped staying parallel with me and began to stay slightly behind me. After what felt like an eternity, I made it to my fifth sampling spot 95 meters into the stream. Just my luck that day, the longest sampling for the day had wild dogs. I felt a wave of relief since I could now turn around and make my way back to the van, but I had to stay in the stream since the stream banks were still too steep to climb out. The dogs had a different plan. All the way through the stream they stayed together, but now they spilt up. One stayed about three to five meters ahead of me, while the other one was behind me about three to five meters. They hadn't made an advance and were still hiding in the woods but having one in front and one behind filled me with dread. Walking in, it was easy to keep my back from being exposed and face them, even if I couldn't see them, but now things changed. I turned so I was parallel with the stream banks the dogs were on and began to make my way downstream. The dogs maintained this pattern for about 70 meters before things become decidedly more dangerous. About 20 meters from the clearing, there is a gradual slope that leads to the water on the dog's side of the stream. The dog ahead of me stretches its lead while the one behind me comes down the slope and enter the stream with me. I raise my meter stick towards the dog in the water and my suburb sampler net to the dog on the stream bank in front of me and begin to yell. Basically, I look like the science nerd version of the gladiator with the net and trident. I can see the clearing, but my eyes just keep darting from dog to dog, and I am slowing backing towards the clearing. The water near the stream dog deepens, and luckily for me, it doesn't want to swim for its meal. It runs up the slope and joins its comrades still ahead of me. From here until the gravelly steep slope on my side of the stream, the dogs stay ahead of me hiding in the brush, but never making a move. I scrambled up the slope and starting making my way to the van. The dogs come out of the woods and advance to the edge of the stream bank. I just kept facing them while backing my up to the van. Once I got back to the van, I hurriedly packed everything back up and left before I could eat my lunch at the stream site. I had to return to that stream about eight more times, but I never saw those dogs again. It was the longest two hours of my life.
I was driving west on U.S. Highway 2 between the city of Ball Club and Benham, Minnesota. This occurred on March 3, 2019 at around 7.15 p.m. I was approaching a black vehicle, and as I got closer it increased its speed keeping pace with me. I was within 100 yards of the vehicle. It went into the oncoming lane of traffic and accelerated, causing the rear of the vehicle to drop slightly. At that instant, a very large cloud of white smoke filled the highway. I slowed my vehicle and turned toward the shoulder on the north side of the highway. As I went through the cloud, I expected to see the vehicle stopped or black marks on the road. Once I was in the cloud, I could see out, but it was still thick. I watched the ditch on the south side of the highway as well, but saw no evidence of the vehicle leaving the roadway. I expected to smell burnt rubber from the tires skidding or spinning on the highway, but there was no smell. As I came out of the cloud, I could see for a couple of miles as the highway was straight. There were vehicles approaching from some distance to the front, but no one going in my direction. I looked in my rearview mirror and there was another vehicle coming around the cloud on the north side also. I wanted to stop that vehicle to see what they saw and thought of the encounter, but I didn't feel comfortable with that knowing how to get them to stop. All I can tell you about the vehicle is that it was a mid-sized black sedan. Nothing special at all about it. I couldn't wrap my head around what I had just seen, and for nearly an hour the hair on my arms stood straight on end. It was a very strange experience. I didn't see it in the air or anything so maybe not connected to a UFO. The only other explanation I can conclude would be spiritual or a ghost if you will. No matter what, I am still very freaked out and bothered by what I witnessed. When I was very young, under 10, my dad would take us to various deer leases for the weekends here in Central Texas. There were always cabins of some sort for us to stay in. This one weekend, we went to a lease near Eagle Lake, where there was an old frame house, one-room affair, really, that was at the end of a very windy road. You couldn't see the house until you came right up on it. Well, this one weekend, we came driving out of the oaks only to notice that there was smoke coming from the chimney, trash all over the yard, etc. There weren't any vehicles, though. My dad stopped the truck, got out his rifle, glassed the house for a little while, then decided whoever was there must have cleared out when they heard the truck coming, and seeing as how there was no way we would have missed a vehicle leaving, they must have bugged out on foot. I still have dreams 20 years later about walking into the house to look around. Whoever had been there obviously loved to smoke as there were ashes and cig butts everywhere. Most of the canned goods we stored up there had been eaten, the cans dumped in the yard, and there was a pot of deer corn. Yes, dear corn, boiling on the stove. The thing that has stuck with me over the years was the smell and the open coloring books scattered on the table with crayons dropped in mid-coloring. Out there in the woods was some poor family with at least one kid. I imagined they sat watching us for quite some time before giving up and wandering off. My dad, lacking much sense, decided that we were staying the weekend. Yah didn't sleep much. My hunting partner Ed and I were into the second week of the Oregon bow season. It was about six when we came upon a stock pond. These ponds are fed by a small spring or small creek. We decided to circumnavigate it to see if we could see what was watering in the area. I went left, Ed went to the right. I hadn't gone far when I came to a depression in the muddy, gravely pond edge. It looked like a very big, heavy person had left a footprint there. I got down and saw that there were toe impressions at the front. Well, I called Ed over to see this, and he said there was another one behind the first. We backtracked the prints and found what appeared to be skid marks on the hillside of the pond. This was just next to the small trickle of water which fed the pond. The hair on the back of my neck stood right up. We went up the hill for about 40 yards, but found indistinguishable impressions in the trashy undergrowth. We went back down and tracked them in the other direction, and the impressions overturned pebbles. 
Broken and bent grasses went about 100 yards down a hill into a ravine thick with manzainta and small scrub oak. We then went back to the foot tracks and covered them with logs so they wouldn't be destroyed. Went home and got some plaster of Paris. We made the impressions and we were shocked to find that there were definitely toes on one cast, the other was in too much gravel to make a good impression. At the same time I took some pictures of Ed stretching to match the stride of the prince. The next week we went into the same area, same skid road, about 300 yards past the stock tank. We were walking side by side when something to my left and slightly behind us, up the hill approximately 100 yards something caught my eye. I spun around to see what it was, and to my astonishment I saw a pair of legs running into the thick underbrush. I couldn't see all of it because of the trees. My impression was of a two-legged creature animal, with long brown hair on the legs running away from us. Ed saw the branches swinging back into place, but saw nothing else. We both got spooked and quickly went back to the truck and never hunted there again. I gave the plaster cast to my nephew in San Jose, California, and have never seen them again. I still have the photos of Ed stretching to match the stride. The footprints measured 18 foot long by 6 across the heel and 8 foot across the ball of the foot. I got some hair samples from a star thistle down in the ravine and I still have them. I have to preface this story by saying that what I'm about to recount is a true story. I know it sounds like something out of a horror movie, but I assure you every word I'm about to share is as real as the road I drive on. My name is Jack, and I've been a trucker for over a decade. I've seen my fair share of strange things on the open road. So it was a usual route for me, driving along a desolate highway late at night. The moon was obscured by heavy clouds, casting an eerie glow over the barren landscape. That's when I saw him, standing on the side of the road, thumb outstretched. The hitchhiker seemed ordinary enough at first glance, dressed in worn-out jeans and a tattered jacket. With a sigh, I decided to offer him a ride. Little did I know that decision would alter the course of my life forever. As the journey progressed, I couldn't shake an unsettling feeling. Strange occurrences began to unfold and I started to question my decision to pick up this hitchhiker. The air in the cab grew heavy with an otherworldly presence, and I caught glimpses of an unnatural shadow out of the corner of my eye. It was as if the very fabric of reality was shifting around us. Then, without warning, the hitchhiker's face twisted in agony, and he vomited onto the floor of the truck. I immediately pulled over, concern etched across my face. Are you okay? I asked, my voice trembling with worry. But as I glanced at him, something unfathomable happened. The hitchhiker's body convulsed and contorted in an inhuman manner. His form began to change before my eyes, morphing into a creature that defied all logic. It was a creature I struggled to find words to describe, but I'll do my best. It was completely white, bald, impossibly thin, and its humanoid shape lacked any discernible facial features. No eyes, no nose, nothing. It loomed over me, crouched in a position that made its true height difficult to determine. But let me tell you, it was towering at least nine feet tall. Fear coursed through my veins, overpowering any sense of rationality. In a panic, I threw open the door and sprinted as fast as my trembling legs could carry me. I didn't look back. I didn't dare. Only after what felt like an eternity did I finally slow down and catch my breath. But the creature was nowhere in sight. It hadn't followed me. After gathering my wits, I cautiously made my way back to the truck. My heart sank as I realized it was empty, as if the hitchhiker and the creature had vanished into thin air. Confusion and dread consumed me. To this day, I can't explain what I saw or what became of the hitchhiker or the creature. All I know is that my encounter that night was undeniably real. Growing up, we had a big house on the water set back a couple acres from the road. 
Most of the land around us was swamp, and when I was 14 my dog brought up part of a human arm. Mom and I were binging Heroes 2007 and Biscuit got out. We ignored him, and I saw the dog rush past the library window with what looked like a big all fish swinging in his jaw. I go on to bed and she hollers for me and comes to my room wide-eyed. I don't what this is. I go out and it's past the truck and garage in the wide empty space that was there. I shine a light on it and I'm not quite sure what I'm seeing. It's a piece of flesh with three little bones sticking out of one end. My vision does a complete 360 and I curse and look at mom who looks terrified. Ma, you need to call the cops. The police show up, poke it with a stick, then put it in a bag and hold it out the window as they drove to the substation. We later heard reports on CNN about people being cut up and their bodies strewn all along the panhandle. The arm was large and flabby with what looked like a small pox scar. Our area used to be a hiding place for criminals and bodies. People used to find corpses in their yards after heavy rains. We even had a guy break out of prison transport and run through our yard in the middle of the night. Gotta love Florida. I was around 15 years old and lived and still living there in the wonderful Bavarian landscape in a small village. As you might know, we in Bavaria are proud of our tradition and our beer, and so we had something what you would call a party or carnival, only for people of our village. As I was the cool boy in our village, I told the other kids what we can play. We played football soccer first, but I got bored and asked my friends if we are going to run around the village and play with our wooden and a friend of mine, even had a softer, just a weak one, though guns. So we went into barns and and all that stuff and shoot each other. It was great fun. Till one point we were in a barn of an old farmer, but everyone liked him cause he always gave us sweets and told us funny things. He was 83 at that point. One room of the barn was the old slaughter room. When we played in there in front of us was an old door, but it was locked. But I could have sworn I heard something like a quiet clicking. Generally, it was a really old barn and my dad told me that it has some underground tunnels and rooms cause of the World War Roman II. The years did pass and the old man died. His wife died almost ten years ago and the only son and heir decided to demolish the old barn. What they found in the room with the locked door is still kinda a mystery and police and news were all at the place but nobody besides the police and the special teams knew what it was. Later, the newspapers got the information that there was an old bomb of the WW2. But fortunately, my dad helped the son with the work and saw it first together with the son. He never told me till a few months ago. Until that day, only few people knew the real story. He basically built something like a throne of old World War II souvenirs as a national coat of arms and pictures of Austrian painter. There were old radios and medal of Nazis, and a lot of letters in which he wrote about operate behind enemy lines, and in which he wrote to his wife, and that she has to be quiet. In the middle of the room there was the bomb, and it was indeed still ticking, and one of the best obtained bombs of the World War, and is now in a museum. Diffused. No one knew he was that guy. I was so shocked and I can only tell you that people in our village still tell rumors about more tunnels and hidden rooms. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night folks and see you tomorrow at the same time.